Before I start, I have to make a correction. Otherwise, when I'm back to Brazil, I'll be killed. Um, the church I'm pastoring now, it is not in Sao Paulo. It is in Goiânia. It's the capital of a state right in the middle of Brazil. So I, I need to say that. Otherwise, when I get there, you know what uh, may happen. Um, uh, I was thinking about what should I say by way of introduction. Uh, just listening to what John Piper, Don Carson, and Tim Keller said in their introduction just before me. Um, first, I would say that I wish that Brazil were closer to Minneapolis, <laughs> Chicago, and New York. Second, this is one of the times, few times, in which I have earnestly prayed for the gift of tongues. And third, I am younger than John Piper, Don Carson, and probably Tim Keller. <laughs> Please open your Bibles in John chapter 14 and keep it open. We read as we uh, go on in the exposition. Let's just have a word of prayer. Lord, open our eyes so that we can see the wonders of your law. Help us to understand everything that you have taught us in this passage. Apply the teaching to our hearts. Bring comfort to those who are here tonight with troubled hearts. And help us to understand how this hope of going to the Father's house can have an impact in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. John 14, from 1 to 14. Jesus said these words when he was with his disciples in the upper room on the night he was betrayed, as you know. He had earlier entered Jerusalem as the long-awaited king of the Jews riding a donkey, for the Feast of Passover. You have that in chapter 12, 12 to 19. Some Greeks came to see him during the feast. Jesus knows now that the time had come for him to suffer and die for his people, both Jews and Gentiles. At the same time, the Jews under the Pharisees, scribes and the high priest, increased their opposition to Jesus refusing to believe in him as the Messiah, the Son of God, despite the many signs he did. Jesus then turns his attention to his disciples, those who have believed and followed him. He brings them to the upper room where he starts to prepare them for his passion and his departure to the Father. He cleanses them, washing their feet, meaning, of course, their spiritual cleansing by his blood, 13, 1 to 20. He separates the traitor from among them. Judas goes away after Satan has entered him, 13, 21 to 30. Then Jesus starts to give instructions to his disciple as, disciples as to what was about to happen and the things that were to come. And he starts by telling them he's about to depart from them and go where they could not follow him, although that would happen later. He gives them a new commandment to love one another. And then Peter gets very disturbed by Jesus' words that he's going away from them. And even more when Jesus says that Peter was to deny him not less than three times that night. 13, 36 to 38. And all this sets the stage for Jesus' well-known discourse about the Father's house and the way there. Chapter 14, 1 to 14. His practical purpose at that night, at that moment, was to calm down the disciples' anxiety. I think the passage can be divided into five parts, if you follow me. First part, Jesus tells them not to be troubled. This is just verse 1. Second, he gives them three reasons for that. 
verses 2 and 3. There are many rooms in his father's house. He's going there to prepare a place for them, and he will come back to get them and be with them forever. Now the third division. He teaches them the way to the Father's house. This is verses 4 to 6. 5. He tells them that they can enjoy the Father here and now before going to the Father's house by faith in Him, Jesus. Verses 7 to 11. And finally, besides knowing the Father here and now, they would be able to continue Jesus' ministry by faith in Him. Verses 12 to 14. So let's try to unpack, unpack each of these parts for you now. Number one, Jesus tells them not to be troubled. Let's read verse one. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Even though Jesus was troubled himself, as we read in chapter 12, verse 27, he, he was still concerned to help his troubled friends. And this, show the, and this shows the heart of our Savior. Even in the midst of his uh, trials, he was attentive, he was caring for those who were his. The reason Jesus tells them, let not your hearts be troubled, he said that because they were sad and perplexed with two things Jesus has just said in the previous verses. First, he would soon leave them and go to a place where they could not find him. Jesus was referring to his imminent death. They did not understand that yet, but still they felt sad with the idea that Jesus was going to leave them and they would not be able to find him. And not only they were sad, they were uh, confused and, and perplexed. How did his departure fit within the expectation that he was the one who would bring about the long-awaited kingdom of God? The second reason why they were troubled was Jesus' affirmation that Peter would deny him not less than three times. It is not difficult to imagine the turmoil in their hearts, the shame, the fear. That's why Jesus says at first, let not your hearts be troubled. Then he puts it in a positive form. Believe in God, believe also in me, in me, verse 1. Now, you know, there are several possible ways to translate these verbs. I cannot enter the discussion here. I will assume the position that seems to fit better the context. That is, both verbs are imperatives. Believe in God, believe in me. The meaning of, of what Jesus is saying here appears to be this. To believe him, I mean, to believe in God and in him, Jesus Christ, would prevent them, the disciples, from being troubled with the expectation of Jesus' imminent parting and Peter's denial. They should believe him just as they believed in God because Jesus and the Father are one. That means that as God, Jesus would never leave them alone forever, neither would he abandon Peter after the fall, after his fall. So this is the command he gives them. Now the reasons, this is number two, the reasons Jesus gives them not to be troubled. And then we go from verse two to three. I'll read them. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. There are basically three reasons here for the disciples to have peace in the midst of perplexity. First one, there are many rooms in his father's house. This is what Jesus says in verse two. In my father's house are many rooms. Second, he was going there to prepare a place for them. The end of verse two, he says, I'll go 
I'll go to prepare a place for you. And then number three, when uh, he would then come back to them and they would be together with him forever. This is verse three. I'll come again. I'll take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Now let's look at the first reason why they shouldn't be troubled. The reason is in my father's house are many rooms. Now the point, the points in this passage that really need an explanation are these two, as you know. First, what is the father's house? And second, what's the meaning of the many rooms? I believe the best interpretation of these points and the passage itself is this. Jesus is saying that after his death and resurrection, he will go to heaven, the place where the father is, the place of his dwelling. Jesus calls it my father's house, not only to comfort the disciples with a cozy metaphor, but perhaps in contrast to the temple of Jerusalem, the earthly house of God from which the disciples would soon be expelled. The many rooms in the father's house simply means that there is enough room there for them and for all those that would come later. For example, those Greeks that wanted to see Jesus and all the other Gentiles and Jews that would later believe and even us. Now, the second reason for them not to let their hearts to be troubled, Jesus says he was going to prepare a place for them. End of verse 2, I'll go prepare a place for you. And beginning of verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you. And uh, of course, the point here is, what is this preparation? Now, we should not imagine that the Lord Jesus Christ is in some way building mansions or houses for us in heaven. He's not even improving or repairing what was ready since the foundation of the world. Actually, he says in the Gospel of Matthew to those who will be saved, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And in Hebrews, he says, in reference to God's rest, his works were finished from the foundation of the world. So what is this uh, preparation then? I, I believe Jesus' death and resurrection would be the preparation itself. He was going to prepare a place for them and for us by, by just going there through his death and resurrection. The rooms are ready, but we are not able to get in. Jesus prepares a place for us by dying on the cross for our sins. He opens the way to the Father's house. And if this was not so, he would have told them. Therefore, what would seem uh, at first to be a cause for a great turmoil in their hearts was actually the opposite. It was reason for joy, hope, and comfort. His departure was necessary for our entry in the Father's house. Now, the third reason Jesus gives them not to be troubled is this. After he had prepared a room for them, he would come back to take them and receive them, and they would be together forever. This is what he says in verse 3, as I read again. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. There are several points in this text that deserve closer attention, especially these two. When would Jesus come back to take them? And Second, what does it mean that they would stay with him forever? Now let's, let's see, let's look at the first one. When would Jesus come back to them according to verse 3? People have tried different answers to this question, as you know. Uh, some would say that Jesus came back to them after the resurrection. Others that he came back to them in the spirit in the day of Pentecost. And he is with us up to this very day. Others would say that Jesus comes to us when we die, as he came to meet Stephen when he was stoned by the Jews. Others that Jesus is talking about his second coming, 
and others say that this statement was left vague intentionally in order to accommodate all these possibilities. Now, I think that the best interpretation is that Jesus is referring to his second coming. Of course, this does not exclude the other comings because the idea of Jesus coming to his disciples occurs several times in John with all these meanings. But the idea of the second coming fits better in the context of I will come back from my father's house, I will take you with me, and we will be together forever. In other words, Jesus is saying, let not your hearts be troubled. I'm going to die, yes, but I will live again. I'll go to heaven, and then I will come back publicly, openly, before the eyes of the whole world to take you to be with me forever. I think this is the best explanation of the text. Now, this raises the question, uh, and it is a question too in this part, where exactly would they be together forever after the return of Jesus? Now, um, as we, we read the text, it is clear that it is from the Father's house that Jesus was going to come back and receive them. And it is there, following the flow of the text, that they will stay forever. Notice that Jesus says, I will come again and will take you to myself. And uh, John Piper has a, a very, very good preaching a sermon on this where he points out that Jesus is not concerned about a place. He, he, he is concerned about his person, to, that he's coming to take them to himself. To himself. So the text is about being with Jesus after all. So in verse 2, it seems clear that the Father's house is heaven, the place of God's dwelling. But then we know heaven is not our final destination. We are not going to stay in heaven forever. It is an intermediate state. So now in verse 3, Jesus seems to expand the meaning of Father's house to include the new kingdom, the new world that he was going to bring about in his return, where he would then stay forever with his people and heaven would continue on earth. The Father's house, to put in another words, seems to be God's kingdom, both heaven after death and the new heaven and earth where we shall be with Jesus forever. And what binds these two stages together is that Jesus will be there. His presence is the essence of the kingdom, whatever form it takes. Now, what John Piper and Don Carson said about prophecy being like seeing two or three mountains in one, I'm going to say it is the same thing here. When Jesus speaks of the Father's house, he has in mind not only heaven, where he would go after his death and resurrection, and where we go after we die, but also the new heavens and the new earth, which are, in a way, a continuation of heaven. So it is in this way that Jesus comforts the disciples' hearts pointing to the kingdom in which we enter after we die and where we shall live forever. Now let's go to point division number three. When Jesus explained to them the way to the Father's house, verse four to seven, that I read now. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have, have seen him. At first, Jesus seems to assume that his disciples uh, knew what he was talking about. That is the way he was going. This is in verse 4 you know the way to where I'm going. You know, this is easy 
to understand why Jesus said that uh, Jesus had been teaching them for three years about God's kingdom, his unity with the Father, and the need for one to believe in him uh, to have eternal life. By that time, they should have at least some hint as to what Jesus was saying. Thomas' reaction, however, seems to show that the disciples were not quite, quite sure about what Jesus was saying. Verse 5. Thomas, speaking for the others, declares openly that they don't know where Jesus is going and therefore they have no idea how to get there. Now, we should not think that Jesus uh, made a mistake in his assessment of the disciples' level of understanding. Remember that the disciples are consistently depicted in this gospel as a slow of understanding and frequently misunderstanding Jesus' words. So what Jesus probably wanted was to provoke what comes next when then presents himself as the way to the Father's house. Verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Not only he was going to the Father's house to prepare a place, but he himself was the way there, the only way through which the disciples could come to the Father's house. And not only that, but because he was the way, he was also the truth and the life. The truth because he was God's perfect revelation as to the way, as to the way a lost world could come to God. And he was the life because only in him could the world find life and life eternal. These are two themes that occur frequently in the Gospel of John. And that's also the reason why he says that no one comes to the Father except through him. He was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Nobody else did the same thing. He would give his flesh to eat and his blood to drink for the life of his people. So this is the reason why he's the way, the truth, and the life. If the disciples had really understood who Jesus was, they would have already known that he was the way to the Father and to the Father's house. As he says in verse 7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. There is a rebuke here, I know, even if mild. They should have known by that time, not only that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, but that Jesus was God's perfect revelation. Yes, he was God himself. To see Jesus then was the same as to see God. Therefore, to believe, to know, to see Jesus was to really know, see, and come to the Father and his house. Jesus Christ is the way there. He is the way to the Father. Now let me go to the fourth division. Jesus declares that they actually can know the Father and see the Father in the present world, world before being taken by Jesus to the Father's house and to himself. Verses 8 to 11. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me or else believe on account of the works themselves. Now, this section starts with a request by Philip in verse 8. Show us the Father and it is enough for us. Philip seems to be asking kind of a vision of God like, that, uh, like Moses did in the past. Uh, there in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, uh, Moses says to God, please uh, show me your glory. Apparently, Philip wants the same thing. Uh, for him, if God would just appear to them, the matter was over. No more explanations would be necessary. All would be crystal clear. And 
that would be sufficient for them to face the coming trials, the shame and the fears. Let me see God. I want a vision of God. Uh, his request was provoked probably by what Jesus said in verse 7 when he says that to see him or when he says that from now on you know him and have seen him. When Jesus says from now on that's probably he's probably referring to uh, after his death and resurrection. Now Philip says, when Jesus says, uh, you're going to see him, uh, Philip says, well, well this, is, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, go ahead and shows, show us the Father. And this is enough. Jesus answers in verse 9 that the encounter with God that Philip is asking for has been happening for three years already. Verse 9. Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? How was it possible that after all that time, Philip and the others had not yet understood that Jesus was God and that to see him was to see God? All the time, God was there beside them. They had touched God, they had spoken to God, they had had meals with God, they walked miles and miles side by side with God. Apparently, Philip and the others did not lack faith in God and in Jesus. They lacked a full understanding of Jesus' divinity and that he was the image of the invisible God, the radiance of the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature. As Jesus says in the first part of verse 10 and in the first part of verse 11 as well. Jesus then asked them, not only Thomas, to believe he is in God and that God is in him on account of two things. First, the words he spoke words that came from the Father, an argument that he had used earlier with the Jews. And of verse 10, he says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. So what Jesus wants them to do is to believe in him on account of the words he is speaking, because these words come from the Father. But not only words, Jesus wants them to believe because of the works the Father is doing through him. Verse 11, when he says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. By works, no doubt, no doubt, Jesus meant primarily his signs and miracles. There would be enough evidence that God was in him, like walking on the water, multiplying bread and fish, turning water into wine, resurrecting the dead. But of course, the word works may include more than just the signs. It may also refer to Jesus' actions of love, ministry, attitude, that could only be explained if God was in him. If they believed based on those works, that Jesus was in God and that God was in him, they would see the Father here and now, even before going to his house. And what a comfort for troubled hearts. Now my last division, last but not least, and certainly not less surprising. Jesus tells them that those who believe in him would be able to do the same works he did. In fact, even greater works. Verses 12 to 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, let's pause for a moment here and remember what is the main practical goal of this passage. Jesus is trying to quiet the turmoil 
in the heart of his disciples. He told them that he was going to prepare a place for them in his father's house where there were enough rooms for them and others. He said that he would come back to take them and be with them forever. He said also that they could already know the Father and see the Father by faith in him, Jesus, uh, uh, here and now. And now he tells them that by faith in him, they would be able to continue his ministry after he was gone to the Father. And what a great comfort, isn't it? From a troubled heart in the present to a confident future where they would continue the Master's work. Now, there are several points to be noticed in this remarkable passage, but I'll keep myself to what seems to be the two main ones. First, what are the works Jesus is talking about? Verse 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. What does he mean by that? As we said before, there is no doubt that miracles, signs are in view here. We should not try to exclude this meaning because of our commitment to a theological instance that does not allow for signs of any kind today. More because of the wrong way in which this passage has been read and used by false teachers and false prophets today. At the same time, we should consider that signs are just a piece of the whole. The expression works is broader than signs in the Gospel of John. Works could also include, as I mentioned before, what Jesus did. Preaching, teaching, ministering to the poor, and yes, doing miracle, miracles if that is what God's will. And what in all this would be done, mark this, not only by the twelve, but by all those who believed in him. Second, in what sense would the work of those, the works of those who believed in him be greater? Of course, the most common interpretation of this passage, the most popular one, is that Christians who have enough faith are able to do greater miracles than Jesus did. And this is a very widespread interpretation of the passage, at least in Latin America and Brazil, where the Pentecostals and Neo-Pentecostal churches greatly outnumber the Reformed and historical churches. Uh, even though it seems easy to tell them and to show them that no one is doing any miracles today that come even close to walking on water, multiplying bread and fish, and raising a man that was dead for four days, Still, uh, this interpretation continues unabated in those circles. I think that the key to understand what Jesus meant can be found first in the reason he gave to his disciples and in the promise he made them concern these words. First, the reason by which they would be able to do the same works that he did and even greater was that he was going to the Father. Verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. His going to the Father meant his exaltation and the inauguration of the new era, era marked by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because, in terms of redemptive historical sequence and fulfillment, the times would be greater after Jesus' death, resurrection, and exaltation, the works done by his disciples after those events would also be greater, not necessarily in number, extension, and power, but primarily because of their salvation historical character. In Don Carson's words in his commentary on John, the signs would have a more clear meaning and reach their full purpose. Everything would now be done in the light of Jesus' death and resurrection. This is why they would be greater. Now the promise he made them. He told them that uh, he would answer their prayers in his name, anything they asked to the glory of the Father 
Verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. We should notice that this promise here is not a blank check for you to fill up with anything you want. This promise was given in the context of the other promise about doing the works of Jesus. What he means here is that in the process, in the, in the doing of uh, uh, these works, he would be ready to answer our prayers, to be like him, to have power to do his works, to minister to people, to announce the gospel, to have compassion on the poor. So you should not take this promise isolated from the context. It is a promise related to the other one about greater works, meaning a ministry where, of course, the supernatural can occur, but which is geared towards blessing other people, mainly by preaching and teaching. When he put these things together, what we get is this. Jesus would continue to do his work after he went back to the Father to be glorified. And he would use his disciples to continue to do his works. What he did before his death and resurrection is considered in that introduction to the book of Acts as the beginning of his works with a clear implication that the acts of the apostles were what Jesus continued to do through them after resurrection. He was going to send them the Holy Spirit to, to come upon them with power for that purpose. Then the works of his disciples would be greater because they would do them in a greater time a more glorious period in the new era that had dawned with the Lord's resurrection. Of course, they also were able to reach the world while Jesus' ministry was local. They brought greater number of people to the kingdom, like Peter on the day of Pentecost. Peter preached one sermon and 3,000 people got saved. Today we preach 3,000 sermons and one people got saved. Something is wrong. Something's wrong. And of course, they did signs and wonders, and God can do the same today if He so wills. But the promise is related to the continuation of Jesus' ministry. In other words, they would experience in the present world, by faith in Jesus, the powers of the world to come. To do the works of Jesus in the present would be a great comfort and a guarantee that Jesus would come back to them to stay with him forever in the Father's house. Now, let me, in the few minutes that I have left, see the implications of this passage for some present-day issues, and I'm just going to mention them. I have no time to expand them. What is the implication of this passage for the difficult times the church is going through all over the world and in some countries in particular? I'm thinking about persecution that is coming to our brothers and sisters in some parts of the world. I think we should not be ashamed to comfort our hearts and the hearts of those under persecution in many trials with the hope Jesus offers here. He points to the future. Let not your heart be troubled. Then he points to the Father's house. I know that um, some people want us to feel bad when they say that religion is the opiate of the people. Karl Marx had Christianity in mind and our eschatological hope when he said that. People say that by pointing to the future as the hope, ultim ultimate hope of the Christians, this tends to make us forget the present world and the need of the present world. They say that if you have your mind in the clouds, you forget that your feet are on the earth. And so we have been criticized, and sometimes rightly so, because we put our hope in the future, and then we forget that we have to do something here and now. In spite of the fact that this is true in some places and times in history, 
we should not be ashamed to say that in spite of that, despite uh, these mistakes, still the hope of the Christian is the blessed hope of the new heaven and the new earth. Our hope is not here. It is not from here that we will get our comfort. There is no reason here powerful enough to quiet the turmoil in our hearts. The hope that is given us in the Bible is the hope of the eschaton, is the coming kingdom of God that begins in the present but is coming in fullness in the future. Now, what's the, what's the implication of this text for the role of the church in political and social reconstruction, for example? Well, the text shows that the way in which Jesus' disciples impact the world is by doing his works and greater works here and now. And that, of course, as we mentioned, includes acts of compassion and love for those who suffer, but most certainly, as Jesus did, to call on sinners, big and small, to repent from their sins and believe in Jesus for eternal life. Now, I have a difficult time trying to understand, understand how unrepentant sinners can be reconstructed. I believe in common grace, but we know that common grace does not convert sinners. The gospel does. Now, what is the impact of this text for the debate about the gifts of the Spirit today? I believe this passage teaches us to admit that God can work miracles today in answer to the prayers of His people. But it also teaches that signs should not be our main concern at all. Philip wanted to have an immediate vision of God. Jesus responded with the Incarnation. Now, what is the impact of this text for the question if there is salvation in other religions, if there is salvation outside Christ, or even if all men will be saved in the end? I think that the passage gives us an unequivocal answer to all these questions. No, there is no salvation outside the knowledge of Christ and faith in Him. And no, the Father's house is only for those that believe that Jesus is the Son of God, our only Savior. Some people don't believe, so they won't be there. And uh, what about the ongoing eschatological debate? I think the text teaches us that the essence of our eschatological hope is to be with Jesus forever. Does not matter if in a millennia or not. The point is, our hope is His person, is His presence. We should, uh, this should kind of moderate the tone of our discussions about scatology and season with love the way we disagree with one another. And finally, what is the impact of this text for you and me right now? Now, how do you know you have a key for one of those rooms in the Father's house. You are here tonight. I want to ask you this. How do you know you have a room there? There is only one answer in the light of this text. Do I see the works Jesus did in me? Is Jesus working today through me in answer to my prayers? Do I see in me the works of the Spirit, like love and compassion for others? Do I have a desire to live for His glory as Jesus did? This is the only way that we have to assure ourselves that, yes, I know the way, I know the truth, and I know the life. And among those places, among those many rooms in my Father's house, in Jesus, in Jesus' Father's house, there is one for me. May the Lord bless you tonight with this word and that you and me would be ready to do His works by faith, remembering that He is the way to the Father's house. And this is our hope here and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, please apply this word to our hearts. Fill our hearts with the hope 
to be in the Father's house and then forever when Jesus comes back to take us to be with him forever. Lord, bless those who are under persecution in some corner of this world today. There are so many. And even when we are not persecuted as they are, even in our countries where there is freedom of expression and religion, when we suffer, Lord, let us remember that it is only you that can calm our troubled hearts. Let us put our faith in you and our hope in you. We know that there is no comfort in this earth for our troubled hearts. Lord, help us to be available to you by faith to do the works you want us to do. Work through us greater things. Bless thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, Lord, through your church today in many places in this world. And teach us, Lord, to walk according to your will as we wait Jesus' return to take us to be with him forever. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you.